I would not have you ignorant concerning spiritual gifts. Concerning spiritual gifts. And the church wouldn't be more ignorant about anything like they're ignorant about this right here. As a whole, and I think it's changing because we're getting more intrigued about it, and the church is beginning to be more discerning about him. But the church was always created and it was established as a spiritual entity. You're a spirit. You live in a body and you possess a soul. All right? So in that, you are body You are soul, and you are spirit. I got a hold of this. Pat and I got a hold of this years ago. I would, I would go. I would pray and seek the Holy Spirit, get direction. I had. Uh, we had went through seminary, and seminary is good. It probably what was better for me than seminary, which when we got into seminary, I'd already gone through with a corporation. I, I went to this corporation, and I, I've talked to you about my learning disabilities, that, that I had learning disabilities through college or through high school. It wasn't until I got to college I found out what was wrong, how I was hardwired and how I had to work with that hard wire to, to receive and understand. And just thank God there was somebody, a professor at the college, that was willing to take out some time and work with me. And in that, reading was a big, was a, was a, a, a problem. Uh, you know, reading for me, I couldn't just read it as an assignment. Because anything I read, the way I'm hardwired, I have to understand it. If I don't comprehend it, I, I just set it aside. And for me to comprehend it, I have to read it several times. Several times. And a lot of times if it's something new, Pat knows, I, the televisions have got to be off. I'm just, I'm a difficulty to live with if I'm trying to receive something because everything has to be turned off. I have to have silence. I can't, the phone call, I can't take any of it. I just shut everything down because I'm trying to receive something. Here. And so in, in that, uh, our, I got to the, I got into management training. They got me up in Marshall, Minnesota, and they cut our salary by like six thousand dollars a year. And I thought, who puts people in management and cuts their salary to be a manager? This is insane. And they said, well, we'll give it all back to you plus a bonus. But in order to get that, you have to read books. And I'm going, oh, no. I'm just thinking about our financial situation at home, thinking, this is not going to go well. Because I have a time frame to read books. And, and so while everybody else was out partying, going to different locations in the United States, doing manager stuff, you know. Uh, there's management stuff to do in those in corporations, but a whole lot of it, you're having a lot of fun, okay? Well, Dean wasn't having any fun. Dean was at the hotel because Pat was expecting a salary of a certain level, and I had to make sure that was produced. So I was sitting in my, in my while everybody else was having fun, Dean was at home having none. I was, I was trying my best to remember, you know, what, and, and read because I couldn't just read it. 
I had to know what I was reading. And they started paying us. When I came back, Pat and I began to apply that to our children, and we made readers out of our kids. Because you can't get, we give no, we give no, we gave no allowances. You're not getting paid for nothing here. And you're not getting paid to mow the lawn, do dishes, do clothes, iron clothes. You're not, you're not running a sweeper. That's part of living as a team here at the house. But here's what we will pay you to do. We'll pay you to read a book. And we start paying them to read a book. And we have to take the books that we cheat. Okay? And so as they begin to read those books, they became readers. And there was a benefit. By them paying me to read, I became a reader. And, and then when we went through seminary, I was prepared for that. But there was no bonus. But the bonus was what I was learning from off the pew of the church to going into a realm of learning at a, at a deeper level. And what was amazing to me when I got in there, I was just going, why does, why does the church know this? Oh, well, this is for the ministry. This is not for the church. Are you kidding me? You can live at a higher level with this information, you know? Well, yeah, but. I'm thinking, no, there's no yeah, but about this. I can preach this. No, you can't preach that. Well, I preach it all the time now. Okay? And so, so in that process of learning, I began to get real, I want to be distinctive about my books. And I would pray and I'd ask God, I'd ask the Holy Spirit, lead me when I go in the bookstore of what to look for. And, and the one book that revolutionized our life, and I don't even think it's in circulation now, Lester Sumrall wrote it, and it was called Body, Soul, and Spirit. And the pages are just as brown as they could be, you know. But Pat and I, we just loved this, the material that was in this. I put it away somewhere, and it got flattened out good again. But um, when we got the revelation that we were, we were, when we got saved, our spirit man was completely saved. You can't be any more saved than what you are right now. You're saved. Your sins are washed away. Remember last week when I talked about the, the, the two birds that, that the priest, when, when there was leprosy, Jesus never healed anybody of leprosy. And in the Old Testament, no one was ever healed of leprosy. Everyone that, was, everyone that recovered from leprosy was cleansed of leprosy. And you, there's a big difference between being healed and cleansed. It was washed away. You are cleansed from your sin. The Bible says, come now, let us reason together, and I will make your sins white as snow. Right? It's going to cleanse you completely. And, we, and, and, and understanding that in the church has been a real dilemma because we don't understand body, soul, and spirit. So your spirit, man, now has come to life. I explained it last night at Dark Horse that what happened to you, what, what literally happened to you was the word of God, the same word that was spoken over Mary, that anointed word went into her womb as a seed and created. The word created. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word became flesh. The word is that powerful that it is a seed that touched her womb, the, the egg in her womb, and created Jesus Christ. In the beginning, he was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word. That's how powerful the word is. That's why the Bible says life and death is in the power of your tongue. And he that loves it lives by it. So listen, we've got to understand that, 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 that we, are, we are a brand new creature that has never, never walked on the face of the planet before. We are here by divine destiny of Jesus Christ. His word hit you and brought you to a place where you knew you needed. You received him as your personal savior. And when you did, Romans says it was by the word that that happened. And when the word came and you received that about him and you believed that and you received, you became a new creature in Christ. All things have passed away and behold now all things have all things have become new to you. So now you're new. Nothing like you's ever walked on the planet before. 
Because you're unique. Alright? And you're a new creature now in Christ. Born again. That's why we call it born again. Amen. Alright? But if we've experienced this and we know the experience is real, we know something happened to us, we know there's something different about us, we know that. But why is it that we don't look like, act like, and, and talk like what we know we are? Because we have a soul. And that soul is made up of the mind, the will, and the emotions. Now, you'll get some Vic Porter. He teaches about four or five other things like that. And so does Sarah Smith. But I, I like the KISS method. Rick and I talk about that all the time. Remember the KISS method. Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> I can relate to that, so it's good for me. All right? Uh, keep it simple. Because here's the thing. When the mind, the will, and the emotions, we, there is a program called a personality profile. I believe in personality profiles. I like personality profiles because it skips ahead. It, it, it takes you from... Getting, having to get to know someone in a, I mean, you're, you're wanting to examine someone to take a position in your church in a, in a, or in your office or in your business or something. And quite frankly, you can find out from, you know, well, their family says they're good, this one says, but you really don't know that person. And it's going to take you years to get to know that person. So you're better off doing a personality profile to find out who that person is. So then, when you put them in a position, you're not expecting something out of them they can't produce for you. Now, the thing about the personality profile is the personality profile can change. And those who are not professional in it say it can't. The professionals will tell you it can. When I took my first personality profile, I took that personality profile. I was so proud of it. Because out of the group that we were in, I was the special one. Because, you know, in management, you want, either, you want to see a high C or a high D. That's, you've got to have one of the two. Because a steady Eddie just won't make a leader. He's there to be led. Okay? The high I, they're just really too much personality for anybody to follow. You need somebody who's conscientious and who, underst and who understands the, the large picture. D's understand the large picture. C's understand the particulars. And you've got to have one of those in management. I ranked top in both of them. And I was like, I'm going to be the super manager. I was so proud. Oh, proud. I was so proud of that test, Rick. I'm looking around and talking to all the other managers. What, what, what'd yours test out? Huh? 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 And a little bit later on, they go, uh, Mr. Hammonds, could we see you in our office? Sure. They're going to tell me how great I am. So I walk in there and I said, we need you to sit down here with the psychiatrist. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm going to tell this. The psychiatrist is going to learn something from me. <laughs> I sit down in front of this guy and he, he says, Mr. Hammonds, he said, how are you doing today? I said, I'm doing just fine. I'm doing great. He said, well, we see you took your pro profile test. He said, did you see the results? I said, oh, I did. I did. I said, those are, aren't those great results? He said, well, yeah, one or, one or two of those are really great results. He said, but both of those, do you understand that's not good? I said, well, I, th I thought it was great. He says, oh, no. He says, uh, he started describing my wife. And I said, how do you know my wife? He says, there's only one kind of personality that you would be attracted to with operating with these two personalities. I said, hmm. She says, and I'm telling you right now. If you don't change, she's going to leave you. <laughs> I said, how do you know that? He says, I'm just, I'm just telling you. We have a few of you come through once in a while, and you think you're really great. And you really will be good at what you do. We're just going to have to, there's going to have to be some change. And he started showing me how that personality is going to and how you don't have to work on it. And you need to go home and you need to talk to your wife. And we need to, we need to get across to her what's going on here and what's happening. And as that happened, then, then I begin. So your personality can change. Do you know how it changes? 
the mind, the will, and the emotions. The mind has to be transformed to the Word of God. The will has to be submitted unto God. And the emotions are controlled by the Word of God. And when you get there, all that other stuff they weren't talking about starts taking place dramatically. You don't have to work on changing your personality. You, I'm telling you, I was hard to live with. I was tough. I mean, I was tough. And I didn't have much time. So high B doesn't have much time for people. They see the big picture and they just say, next. Well, if you take someone who's highly detailed, that has to have it detailed this way, a certain way. I see the one thing wonderful about these, they don't care how you get it done, just get it done. And if you don't get it done, next. But the high C goes, yeah, but it's got to be done this way, a certain way, only the way my mind works. And if I don't get that translated to you very well, sorry, that just stinks for you. You better line up and figure out what I am trying to say, okay? And then while you're trying to figure out what I'm trying to say, I'm already looking at you going, next! <laughs> well, that's destructive. The people that did work underneath me were excellent. It's just I had to go through 52 to get one. You know, people would see me in the grocery store and hate my guts. They go, why is that lady was just cussing under her breath about you? Yeah, she worked for me once. <laughs> Not good. But I found out through the word of God how that could be transformed. Okay? So the domineering factor here is not the body. You can't be listening to the body. The body is the... The body is the workhorse. We don't, we, we receive healing to our body and we command our body to respond to the healing that it receives. It is nothing more than a workhorse. When we begin to understand this, we begin to receive our healing on a, such a higher level and such a quicker level and we understand laying hands on others and they getting healed. Because it's just a body. It's just a house to live in while you're here. And when you get, when you, when Christ comes or when you die, you immediately get a new body. Because you can't live in this earth suit any longer. You are now going to live in another suit. That's why you live, that's why you live eternally either way. Because the spirit man was created to live eternally in conducive with the soul. And if the spirit man is never born again then the soul has nothing left but to live in conduciveness with something lost. So it, it limits the soul to its capacity of what God created you to be and the way God created you to think. That's why whenever you're born again to the born again individual, the Bible says you have the mind of Christ. Well, of course you do because it was always in existence inside your skull. It just never came alive until the spirit man was born. So see, there's more to this thing than just getting saved, going to church, being good, and we got the Holy Ghost wherever we got saved. You got the Holy Ghost when you got saved, but there's more to the Holy Ghost than when you got saved. If there wasn't, Peter would not have went to a church house of believers and said, have you heard of the Holy Spirit? And they said, nobody's ever told us about that. So, well, it's time for you to receive the Holy Spirit. They were already born again. Jesus was born, he was born of the word. He didn't have to be born again. He was born, when he was born, he was created God-man. But still, he could do no marvelous works until he first was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Not baptized in water. There was a water baptism when he came up. The Spirit of God descended upon him. When he descended upon him, it was at that point he was empowered. Jesus said, go to the upper room. Who's he talking to? The world? No, the believer. Go to the upper room. You're already a believer, but you're going to be endued with power from on high so that you can perform and operate as I intended you to operate as he is in this world. As he is, so are you in this world. There is a higher power to operate in. And he's not an it. Well, I got it last night. No, you didn't get it. You received him. 
He's a he. He is the spirit of the living God, living inside the individual and coming upon him and empowering him. Okay? Now, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that because I'm going to go right where I want to go here. It's, uh, we, we can, I mean, I, I, we, we've got all kinds of messages on this. Um, Pat and I have been operating. I've seen the goofy. I've seen the good. I've seen the bad. I've seen the false. I've seen the real. And um, you know what? You get around me, Holy Spirit's going to talk to you. I'm going to know whether you're real or not. I'm going to show you another passage here. You know the bird we talked about? We released the bird last week. One bird died. The blood was, was released into the bowl with pouring water. The water and the blood. We know Jesus Christ. When the, the spear was thrust in his side. What came out of his side? Water and blood. That's our salvation. And what he, he died so that we could live. And then when the one bird was submerged in that, he was released in the open field and signified he is free. He's born again and he's free. Washed in the blood, washed in the water. Washed in the blood of the Lamb, washed in the water of the Word. He is free to go. Amen? But what, what was that? That was symbolicism. Because after that, the individual that was cleansed of leprosy had another thing to go through. Eight days he went through a transformation. Shaved all the hair off of his body. Took away his identity. <laughs> Do we still want to have our identity? He got rid of his identity and clothed, took off his robes and clothes and clothed him in a white garment. What's that representation of? Righteousness. You've been clothed. See what... The church is supposed to do, we have a new salvation, is not give them something to do or tell them how they're supposed to act. We're supposed to tell them who they are. We're supposed to tell them they are now a new creature in Christ. You now have the righteousness of Christ Jesus. You are no longer who you once were. And after eight days of that process, that in other words, there's a time lapse of, of convincing. Okay? And then... During that time, there was sacrifice made. That's all those sacrifices made was a representation of what Christ gave at the cross. And then the priest would dip his finger in the blood, and he would put that blood on the right ear of that individual, the right thumb of that individual, and the right toe of that individual, signifying, signifying now, now you can hear now, now you can hear me. Before you couldn't understand what you were reading in the Bible, but now you understand. Okay? Now whatever you stretch your hand out, I stretch my hand out. And when you pick your feet up, I, I set them down. The paths of the righteous are of the Lord. Amen? The footsteps of the righteous man are ordered of the Lord. Right? Do you see what's happening, the significance of what he's doing? But that he didn't stop there. See? Most denominations want to stop there. On top of the blood, the priest turned around and got the log of oil. And he touched his hand into that oil. And he put his he put the oil on top of the blood. On the right ear. On top of the blood. On the right thumb. Or, and on top of the blood on the right toe. Well, you can hear. You can understand a little bit. God's there. He's working with you. And he's walking with you. But now we're going to give you the power. See, the oil was significant of the Holy Spirit. See, it's not just good enough. It's why you go to so many churches and they are not teaching you anymore. It's just a different way of teaching you, but they're not really te taking you any deeper than what you ever were. Backwater is about as far as you're going to go there.
because they don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that wrote this. He was the divine inspiration of every word. If anyone's going to explain it to you, it's going to have to be him. Without him and his empowerment, you don't have the power to receive and understand. You can hear, but you can't understand. That's why he said, all you're getting, get understanding. I'm getting something, but I don't quite understand it. God's with me, but I don't see the power in it. I'm walking, but my destiny is not fulfilled. There's more because there's the Spirit. All right? So now watch this. This gets pretty cool. Because we're going to answer a question here. And then I'm going to close. All right? I'm getting to I love this thing. It's, it's really helped me. And um, <coughs> all right. Go with me in 2 Corinthians 3.17. Here's a scripture that we have misunderstood. We've misunderstood it for years. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Okay? Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now what we've gathered in, in the realm that I've lived in, and in each realm that we live in in Christianity, because we're so diverse in our Christian beliefs, in some realms it means that because I have the spirit of the Lord came on salvation, I'm, I have liberty, I can do whatever I want, there's no condemnation, I can just do whatever I want to do and everything's good. Some take that to the infinite. You know, my wife worked with, with a, a lovely Baptist woman, and she, um, and I'm, picking on, I'm not picking on the Baptists, I don't even know what, because there's like, there's like over, th there's thousands of different denominations in the Baptist, and they all believe a little bit differently, so I'm not picking on, on the Baptist overall, I'm just saying this is how she believed, this is the way she was raised. She said, you know, that if, if um, she said that, she said something about, she was concerned about a family member, and that family member was sleeping around having affairs. And if the Lord comes or he dies, he's going to hell. They said, you believe that? My pap says, you believe that? I said, oh yeah. So well, what about you? Oh, it won't happen to me. I can sleep around. I'm, I'm Baptist. I'm this, I'm this denomination of Baptist. I'm good. <laughs> you know, I'm covered. Well, there are denominations out there that believe that. Hey, listen, there's some crazy stuff in the Pentecostal. I came out of the Pentecostal realm. They believe some crazy stuff. Okay? Because we veered off of this right here. Okay? We can't veer off of this. What the Bible says, and here's what some of these, they think. They think, hey, I can come into a church and I can do whatever I want to because I have the Spirit that's given me liberty. I can prophesy, I can speak, I can pray, I can do whatever I want to because, hey, I'm, liber I'm liberated. The Holy Spirit is with me. And, and if I feel the Spirit moving and the Spirit touches me and that emotional touch and that I can feel Him. Well, I can just do whatever I want to do. Because where the Spirit is, there is liberty. Amen? Well, let's just take this scripture and let's break it down for a moment. What's the Bible? What does it say? Now the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, notice he uses Lord twice here, there is liberty. Okay, now where is the Spirit of the Lord? Let's just stop there for a minute. Where is the Spirit of the Lord? Well, in Psalms, he gives us some direction on that. Psalms 139, 7 through 12 says, Where can I go to get away from your Spirit? Where can I run to get away from you? If I go to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. If I climb upward on the rays of the morning sun, or your hand would guide me, and your right hand would hold me, or I'm sorry, on the rising sun, land on the most distant, uh, distant shore of the sea. There is the sun where the sun sets. Even there your hand would guide me and your right hand would hold me, hold on to me. 
If I say, let the darkness hide me, and let the light around me turn into night, even the darkness is not too dark for you. Night is as bright as the noonday. Darkness and light are the same to you. In other words, what he's saying is there's nowhere we can go that the Spirit of the Lord is not there, right? You can't run from him. So the Spirit of the Lord is everywhere. Could we agree on that? Now, do we have liberty everywhere? Do you have the liberty of your Christian belief system in Red China, like you do here in Southern Illinois? What about Pakistan? Iraq? Iran? So what is the Bible trying to tell us when he says the spirit of, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty? Then it must not be saying what we've been believing. Because if we say where the Spirit of the Lord is, he's everywhere. So if that's true, he's everywhere, then why isn't there liberty everywhere? Well, I never saw it that way. Hmm. Wait a second. Can I, can, I, can I give you the translation on this? Where the Spirit is Lord. Where the Spirit is Lord. Where the Spirit, where the Spirit of the Lord is Lord is Lord, there is liberty. Now here's the marvelous thing. Sinners can't stop being sinners because it's just who they are. Okay? Sin has dominion over them. They're trapped within a thought process they can't break free of. Psychology can help some. Transformation. But a lot of people that's been through a lot of that psychiatric care I mean, you sit down and have a cup of coffee with them, and you know uh, their cheese is not all on the cracker anymore. <laughs> Come on. Can't you? They have really been messed with. They've really been hurt, broken, and they've really been messed with. Who can, who can heal that? Only Jesus Christ. See, you're different. You are now born again, and your spirit now is alive under Christ. And there is another, there is another life inside of you that is that is questioning constantly this right realm right here. Constantly pushing the borders on this realm right here, knowing that there is a mind that wants to rise up in you called the mind of Christ. And this right here now has to come in conjunction with this right here. When we get this in conjunction with this, or we bring this into submission to this, this lines up automatically. See, we're coming into the church, and we have this, and we have this, and then what we're wanting to do is use behavioral modification to get this into submission. And behavioral modification will not work. It is only the Spirit, and we've got to make, now the Spirit, Holy Spirit, when He comes upon you to empower you, He doesn't come upon this. He comes upon this. You're alive, but now you're going to be empowered. When you're empowered, now you can possess your soul. Up to that point, you're struggling with your soul. Folks, why do you think the Bible says that, it, that, that the days would be shortened because even the very elect could be deceived. It's because we're not, we're coming to an age where the spirit is not in domination of the soul because it's not been empowered. We're just watering this down so much and accepting because we just want to be accepted and we want to accept everybody else because we're just trying to build a community, trying to build a church, trying to build whatever we're trying to build in our name and we're not really convincing people and showing people the truth and the true matter is you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit to empower your live spirit so that you can begin to possess your soul.
transform your mind and your will and your emotions to the mind of Christ, the will of God, and the emotions of Jesus Christ, that your emotions are operating. See, Jesus said he had emotions. He was moved with compassion upon the people and went and healed them. What drove him to heal them? The compassion of Christ, the emotion that he had. But that emotion was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Not by a good feeling and feeling sorry for people and, and a conscience that has been molded in our society that we, we do something for somebody because we feel sorry for them. They're, 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 they're not like we are and they need help and we need to pull them up and, and it's just the right thing to do. And then we do it with our effort and our empowerment and what little we have and it gets exhausted and it's not long before we get calloused because see we reach in a society where almost 50 50 50 percent of us are working and 50 percent of us are we're dragging along behind us because we felt sorry for them and then what begins to happen to us we begin to get callous we almost begin to despise the loafer and we're the ones that created him okay <clears throat> So it's very hard to get stirred up with compassion for the person who comes in in a wheelchair because before he got here in the wheelchair, government came in and cost me thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to redo my building so that we could bring them in. Do you see what's happening? And we're not empowered with compassion. We're doing it because we have to because it's all behavioral modification making us behave and be good people. And that produces lukewarm Christianity that God said, I'll spew out of my mouth. It makes me sick. I'd rather you just not even be empowered. I'd rather you just not even be born again than to be born again with the opportunity of receiving this power and what it was intended to, and then you do it because you have to. And you know why we do it? Because we have to? Because we are not allowing the Spirit of God to be Lord. We're not seeking after Lord. We got what we came for. Our life is together. We're happy. Everything's going well for me. I'm good. You know what that brings me back to? Do you remember the family man? Nicholas Cage is standing out there in the cold weather. He's ran into the angel and doesn't know it's an angel. And and he bought him some, he bought, he paid for his, he, he, he paid for his lottery ticket, you know. And the angel looks at him and says, oh, what can I do for you? He said, oh, I'm good. He said, oh, wow, it must really be neat to be you. Everything's good with the year, you know. That's where the Christian's at. I don't know. Yeah, oh, everything's good with me. I'm fine. I got, I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. I got a good job. I got a good retirement. I got things. Everything's good with me. I'm good. And we're not realizing there's more. And it comes from just, I mean, it's time. Here's, here's what it's time for. As well as that right there. It's time for that. <laughs> it's time to say, hey, Holy Spirit, if you're not Lord of all, you're not Lord at all. And I want to give you permission. Do you hear me? See, you're in control. You're born again. See, you, sin has no dominion over you, and you can do whatever you want to. So the sinner doesn't have a choice. He's in bondage to that old life, to that old nature. You're a new creature. You're free. You can do whatever you want to. But at the point of where you can do whatever you want to, it's time to realize there's more to this thing than just salvation. There's more to this thing. There's more to life than just living and dying. There's more to this. And it's in, it's in and there's more to the, just the introduction of the Holy Spirit. When you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, man, you just got your, your mouth wet. You just got to drink. And now it's time to receive all that he has available for you. Because everything he has available for you is to get you
Christian position to be as Christ is in this world. Aren't you tired of reading about him and him saying, greater things will you do? And you never see the greater things? No, that's not greater things for the preacher. That's not greater things for somebody else. That's greater things will you do? Because the Holy Spirit has come. I have to leave. Because if I don't leave, I can only live inside of you through word form. He's going to live inside of you in essence of God. Amen? So when do we say, okay, I'm in authority here. You've given me authority. You know what the greatest use of your authority is? Your greatest use of authority is to release the Holy Spirit into your life and say, okay, okay, Holy Spirit, I just challenge you. Okay, Holy Spirit, help me to be eminently aware of your presence always. No matter what I'm doing, you're there. You're observing. You're watching. You're studying. May you have position in my life to speak to me. I grant you position in your life to correct me. I grant you position in my life to have an opinion. To have a desire through me so that maybe my desires I'm demanding are not the desires you actually have for me. I give you permission. I give you permission over my will, over my destiny, over my desires. It's you. I give it to you. See, that's where we got to get to. That's where we got to get to, okay? Amen? And this is a very intimate thing. But you've got to find yourself in your bed at night. You've got to find yourself alone somewhere. You've got to find yourself someplace with you and the Holy Spirit. And you just tell him, hey, Holy Spirit, listen. I heard the message. Thank you for bringing it to me. I just wasn't aware of, of just, just, just how, how real you are. And I don't call you an it, but I call you he. And I ask you, come. Come. And you have permission. Come on in. Talk to me. Show me. All right? All right? All right? Lead me. There's a hurting world out there, and you have a word for them. Give me ears that I can hear. Give me the power to hear it now so that whenever they walk in front of me and I stir up the conversation or they stir up the conversation, I have the word straight from heaven to them through me. Oh, be, I give you supreme authority. You be Lord in my life. Man, now we're starting to walk toward a spirit-filled, spirit-led church. Not anything goofy, because there's training coming. We're going to have a healing school. We're going to be training coming, because there's a, there, you need to be trained on how to pray for people here at this church. You need to operate under the authority here at this place. And in that authority, working and operating here. Amen? And that will cultivate you an authority when you walk out the door, the authority of that believer. It is amazing what happens to you when you submit to authority and operate under that authority, what authority you have yourself when you walk out the door. Because see, here at this place, the difference is here at this place, I don't want anybody to walk out of here thinking, well, he's trying to rule us, he's trying to take us back to the old church and that kind of thing. No. But here at this place, we have a um, reputation to uphold. A name to carry in the community. So you can't have somebody get come in here doing whatever they want to. Amen? 
got to change it. And when you get out there, that's your name. You want to you go out there and do whatever you want to with your name, that's fine. But here, we have a name, and we're going to protect it. Because we want to be able to proudly say where I'm from. Amen. I'm, I'm from High Point. Come on to High Point. It's safe there. You don't have to worry about getting all messed up there. Come on to High Point. Amen. All right, folks. Love you. Won't you just stand? Won't you love on one another? Find yourself a place this week and talk to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Turning loose. Amen. Turn him loose. God bless you.